Well, good evening, everyone. I'm CJ Roberts, the Frankie Duckwall President and CEO of the Tampa Bay History Center. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to this year's virtual Duckwall Lecture. As many of you know, the annual Duckwall Lecture is historically one of our most popular programs. And it's not uncommon to see Tico Hall, our primary meeting room, filled to capacity. Uh, this year, of course, things are different. And so we're presenting the lecture digitally. Uh, the good news is it does feel like we're turning a corner in the pandemic, and hopefully our programs will return soon to in-person or at least a, a hybrid model, so we're optimistic. The Duckwall Lecture and my position are named in recognition of the generosity of the Frankie Duckwall Foundation, which is a Tampa Bay Area Foundation, uh, which has supported numerous charities in our community and whose generosity has made a huge impact and quite frankly, has made the Tampa Bay area a much better place. We're very grateful to Duckwall Foundation trustees, Lo Morrison and Sandy Reef for their many years of support of the Tampa Bay History Center. Thank you both so much. I also wanna to thank tonight's presenter, Dr. Jack Davis. I've been a big fan since reading his Pulitzer Prize winning book, The Gulf, The Making of an American Sea. It's an outstanding book. Uh, if you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. And I look forward to reading his newest work. Finally, I wanna thank you all uh, for taking time to tune in this evening. I'm confident you'll be glad that you did and I'm sure you're going to enjoy tonight's program. Uh, now it's my pleasure to hand the program over to the History Center's Curator of Public History, Dr. Brad Massey, to introduce our presenter, Brad. All right, well, thank you very much, CJ. Um, so it's my pleasure to be here today. Um, I'm the Saunders Foundation Curator of Public History here at the Tampa Bay History Center. And um, I actually get to talk tonight to somebody that has played a lot of different roles in my life as a, as a mentor, as a former advisor in graduate school, and as a friend. And I get to talk to Jack Davis, who, of course, is the Rothman Family Chair of Humanities at the University of Florida currently. And he's been a long-running professor um, at the University of Florida. And as a lot of you probably know, he is a Pulitzer Prize-winning author. His book, The Golf, The Making of, of an American Sea, as CJ um, said, won the Pulitzer a few years ago, so it's our pleasure to have Jack here with us tonight. Um, and this is fun for me as Jack's former student. You know, I get to ask the questions now, so you know, I'm trying to put him in an uncomfortable spot. Um, but in all seriousness, I had the pleasure of um, seeing some advanced copies of Jack's book. He sent them over to me um, about a week or so ago, and I read through them. And it's a really great book. It tells this this story of the American bald eagle. And before I turn it over to Jack today, I just want to share one image with you. And um, you guys are going to get a sneak preview of this. Let me see if I can pull it up. This is the working cover of the book. As you can see, the bald eagle, the improbable journey of America's bird, um, which is scheduled to be released March 2022. All right, let me turn my screen off real quick. So I wanted to start our conversation with Jack today with a really simple question. Um, you, you write The Golf, it's a great book. Um, you won the Pulitzer Prize. And it's a, it's a really interesting book in that, you know, it tells this broad story that connects all these places in the Gulf of Mexico, right? Texas and Florida and the Gulf Stream and all these things. So when it came to this project about the bald eagle, you know, why the bald eagle? Why did you decide that you wanted this to be your next subject of your next book? Um, well, before I answer your question, Brad, uh, let me just uh, thank you and CJ um, for having me here the, uh, tonight. Very excited to talk uh, with you. And, and I want to thank, of course, the, the Duckwall Lecture and uh, the Frankie, uh, Frank E. Duckwall Foundation for uh, sponsoring um, th this, this evening. And I also want to um, offer uh, a qualifier and say that you asked some pretty damn tough questions during graduate <laughs> school too. So uh, I wasn't the only one asking the questions. And, um, but, and, and of course, it was a pleasure to work with you um, those, those uh, years, not too long ago, actually. And but at, um, to your question regarding why the, the bald eagle, well, uh, as, as you know, I'm an environmental historian and uh, I'm somebody who writes for a general audience rather than an academic audience, which is not to say my, my work isn't scholarly. Uh, it's it's uh, just, it's somebody once described it as readable scholarship. And, um, and so I, I regard myself as not only an environmental historian, but an environmental writer. And, um, and so when I was, after I'd finished the the Gulf, 
um, and had such a wonderful experience writing that book because I grew up on, on the Gulf of Mexico in the Tampa Bay area, as a matter of fact. And, um, and it felt when I'm writing that book, it felt as though I was really writing a biography, biography of a place and, or that's how I perceived it. And in, in the book before that was a biography of Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, which is really, was really a biography of Douglas and a biography of, of, of the Everglades, once again, a place. And so I wanted to write, do some sort of environmental story and it potentially some sort of biography. And um, the bald eagle uh, needed an updated biography. The last major book written about the bald eagle came out in the 1990s by Bruce Beans. A very nice book, very good book, uh, but foc which focuses on the 20th century period and really our the the the, the closest thing to what I have written uh, was uh, published in 1963 um, by another Floridian, a Polly Redford very good friend of Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. Um, so I wanted to, I, I saw that this uh, biography was, you know, an updated biography was needed. So much has happened in the late 20th and even in the 21st century. Um, and, um, but also I wanted to, in writing another environmental story, I, um, I wanted to write about something that just didn't appeal to the choir. You know, the, you know, uh, the uh, the tree huggers, the butterfly chasers, the people like me, uh, the greenies, and um, and uh, and so like the Gulf of Mexico, which I think reached that broader audience. Um, uh, I it, it's it would be tough going back and not writing something that would reach um, you know as many people as as possible, and uh, the bald eagle just made perfect sense because who doesn't love the bald eagle? Um, and no, no, what are your, no, 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 whatever your political persuasion, um, and whether you uh, embrace it because it's a patriotic symbol or you embrace it because, um, it's a spectacular species and it's also an, an endemic to the United States. It's only in, it only lives in North America and, uh, or maybe you are both, maybe you're the tree hugger and the uh the you know the patriotic american or, and i think most are and um so um i was really surprised that the story was available to write as i was surprised that the gulf of mexico story was available to write when i started that book yeah and it's you know it's interesting as a as a, as a fellow writer i'm really interested in your process and we're going to delve into the book in a second here but mm -hmm. i i think one of the interesting things about this book is it's for those of that have read the golf it's very similar where you give these very in-depth and really elegantly written descriptions of the eagle and then you talk about certain people that we don't think much about when we think about american history mm -hmm. and i remember you told me when you were writing the golf you would write little notes on post-its and you would kind of you kind of put them up and then you were like well how can I bring this story together so just one more method question for you when you were writing this book is that kind of what you did is you found all these interesting stories about the eagle stretching back you know hundreds of years ago all the way to the present and then you just worked to put a compelling narrative together yes that, that's exactly what I did I mean I from the outset I when I wrote wrote the book proposal I figured out what the chapters, you know, and I, I had some sense of what the chapters would look like. And I, um, and I understood at that point, the structure of the book and the organization of, of, of the chapters, which the Gulf wasn't quite like that. It was, it was really hard for me to figure out how to piece that story together. But the bald eagle sort of naturally fell in place because I knew it wanted to follow the chronology of, 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 of American history. And because it's, it's a book about the relationship between the species, the biological species and, um, and uh, the United States primarily uh, without ignoring its relationship with indigenous people. And I know we'll probably talk about that, but yes, I had the post-its on the, um, for each chapter, I do one chapter at a time. I, I can't, I don't want to even think about the other chapters that I'm writing one. I don't want to, if somebody happens to send some research that is, you know, an article or something that is applicable to another chapter, I'll just immediately put it in the file. I don't want that distraction. And so I put post-its up uh, on my file cabinet next to me uh, that uh, identify various themes and people 
in events that I want to um, include in the chapter. And the post-its, as you know, the idea behind those, you can move them however you want. Um, and so you're not committed to this printed outline. Um, I like things being um, a little loose and uh, allowing for uh, change and spontaneity uh, during, the, during the writing process. Yeah, and it, it really comes through. I mean, the book is really interesting and you can see the thought process of how you piece it together, but let's jump into some of the content. So you tell a long story, right? hundred years long. And, you know, one argument you make throughout the book is that the eagle exists somewhere between myth and reality. And, um, you know, there is what the bird actually is. And you write these very interesting descriptions about 7,200 feathers, you know, the, the eagle flies up to 10,000 feet and all these things. Mm -hmm. And then you talk how, it, how it's also been mythologized. And one of the early stories you tell us is the story of, about how the bald eagle comes to adorn the U.S. seal. So I was wondering, maybe you could tell us a little bit of, about the process of getting the eagle on the seal and what that tells us about, you know, the bird as reality and the bird as myth here in the United States. Yeah, I, I see, I see the, in the history of the bald eagle uh, in its relationship with the U.S., um, beginning as soon after the adoption of the Great Seal in 1782, but really more so this begins happening in the, in the 19th century. I see it being, if, if you will, divided into two universes, universes there in parallel universes, there's the species universe, um, the living bird, and then there's the symbol universe. Um, and the, obviously the non-living bird. And, um, and so the, the American people have a differing relationship with, with, uh, with each of those relationships, uh, each of those universes. And, um, and we, one thing we have to understand is that before it was adopted as a national seal, and it was a, it was a protra protracted process coming up with the right design for, for, for the seal, which I'll talk about in just a minute. But before the adoption of the seal, Americans weren't paying a lot of attention to the bald eagle, not as an exalted species, um, not as a symbol. It, was, it, was, uh, it wasn't very common on decorative art um, before 1782, for instance. And, uh, and it was not regarded as a patriotic symbol. And it wasn't actually an obvious choice that initially when Congress uh, on July 4, 1776, uh, within hours of approving the Declaration of Independence, formed a committee to create a great seal of the United States. And a seal is what? For a nation state. It's, it's, it's a signature, you know, it's a stamp signature. It's, it's a, um, it, it, it lends legitimacy to the status, and this is what the U.S. was looking for at the time in 1776, to the status of sovereignty, uh, to the status of a sovereign nation. And so the first committee uh, form included Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, and Benjamin Franklin. Stellar, right? I mean, who, who could you think of to be better members of such a committee? And... Um, those guys fail miserably, though, and everybody thinks Ben Franklin wanted the turkey. That's a myth, um, and uh, which I write about in the book. And I'm not going to tell you what he did, in fact, want, um, because I want to leave that as a teaser. We don't, uh, and um, uh, because it's it's it, it is a, a really a, it's a huge surprise a surprise to me when I learned what his actual proposal was. So, but it took six years. Uh, to devise a seal, and not until the very end uh, was the idea of including the bald eagle uh, forwarded or advanced, and that ca actually came from Charles Thompson, who was the secretary of the Continental Congress. It was his idea. Um, the, the war was coming to an end, and the U.S. desperately needed a, um, a seal, an official seal of approval, uh, it was going to sign peace treaties that needed the seal for that. And Thompson is the one who came up with the bald eagle. And once he did, it made obvious sense to everybody. It's one of those things that are just sitting out there in front of you and everybody's looking past it. And when you finally see it, you say, of course. And that's essentially what the re reaction was. And the people fell in love with the bald eagle as a symbol of the United States. 
Um, I mean, people know what an eagle looks at looks like. I mean, it 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 does and it indeed embody this. It's a it's the embodiment of strength and courage. Um, you know, it has that subortable bone over its eyes, which is that eye. You know that that brow, that bony brow. Um, and it has these large yellow eyes. They're almost the size of an adult male eyes. And uh, it has, as I say in the book, um, its stare is, the, is a do not tread on me stare. Um, and uh, and uh, so and people recognize immediately that this, they had, a, a, um, and plus it's a native bird. Um, and uh, so it was, it was a good choice in everybody's estimation, uh, with the exception of some. <laughs> yeah, and what, I want to talk about this later. You know, you you have this thing about where you talk about how the bird is anthropomorphized, right? Mm -hmm. In other words, it's, it's given human traits. And some of those human traits, a lot of people look at the eagle and say, well, the eagle's a thief. You know, the eagle is this, the eagle is that. Yeah. Um, so I want to talk about those things. But before we do that, I want to show the audience two pictures really quick to kind of set up my next couple questions for you, Jack. Mm -hmm. So these are some images that you sent me. And this one in particular is really interesting. <laughs> um, I mean, Jack, I mean, Lord have mercy. Why would somebody with a crazy look in their eye and a rifle or a shotgun <laughs> actually blast this bird out of the sky? I mean, you were just telling us that, you know, the bird is, the bird is regal. The bird is this, the bird is that. Um, here's another picture I want to show you all real quick. A little bit different depiction of the eagle. You had sent this to me, yeah. you know, earlier before our talk, you know, cer certainly more regal. So what changes? I'm going to stop staring, um, stop sharing my screen here. Um, so the bird is this, this great symbol. Like you yeah. said, regal, it's got this beautiful, you know, this head crest for lack of a better term. Um, uh, it's on the seal, it's holding things, it looks mighty, but then in the 1800s, things change, right? And all of a sudden right. people have this, this different view of the bird. Why does that happen? I mean, why are we blasting out the U.S. seal out of the sky? Yeah, well, that, that's the paradox, isn't it? Yeah. And, and we were blasting out of the sky. Um, we hear about, we know about um, the near extinction of the bison. We know about the extinction of uh, the passenger pigeon, even the Carolina parakeet. And we know of uh, you know, gray wolves disappearing from the east and beavers um, and, and others. But what we don't hear about the, is that the same thing was happening to the bald eagle in the 19th century, um, the living species. Um, we were, Americans were um, killing the bald eagle left and right. Nobody was being condemned by, uh, for it. It wasn't against the law. It is very much so now, uh, and um, and uh, newspapers were writing about these shootings, um, and uh, the and in the reports in the newspapers, um, there was no condemnation uh, of of the actions of of those who had killed the, uh, the eagle. They were uh, these incidents were written up as if um, John Smith had gone down to the lake and caught a twenty five pound bass. Um, and the, um, the Eagle's wingspan was always listed. And I did a search on newspapers.com from um, 1850 to 1920 using the words in quotation marks, bald eagle shot. And I came up with, I think it was 180,000 hits. Um, and, and by the end of the 19th century people, there were some people who were coming forward and, because they were really worried we were losing that the bald eagle would go extinct, that the representative of our, the living representative of our nation would no longer be. And so why are Americans doing that? Well, they see the bald eagle as a, as a predator and uh, they have it as a symbol. They love it as a symbol. Uh, and really as bald eagles were falling out of the skies, more and more of them were going on uh, on the, the logos of businesses and sports teams and uh, um, various organizations. And um, it was going on all sort of a decorative art uh, as it was also falling out of the sky. And Americans believe, well, we can, have our, we can, we can shoot the eagle and have our symbol too. Um, they were two different universes, as, as I said. And um, the belief was that the bald eagle was a, a major uh, threat to uh, farmers and ranchers, 
um, that it could, there was a myth that it could carry away lambs, that it could carry away calves, um, that it could uh, carry away uh, piglets. Uh, it could indeed carry away chickens. At most, a bald eagle can lift five pounds, at most. Um, but there was also a profound myth and a very disturbing myth that bald eagles carried away children and mothers were warned not to leave their infants unattended outdoors. This continues throughout the 19th century, well into the 20th century. Ornithologists are not disputing that myth. Uh, in fact, they're, they're citing um, uh, actually cases in which they had heard about um, of, of, uh, of baby kidnapping. Uh, they're testifying as such before Congress. Uh, they're writing about it in their works. Uh, the uh, Audubon Society, uh, the, the, um, the president of Audubon Society, T. Gilbert Pearson, who was from Alachua, Florida, uh, oh, excuse me, Archer, Florida, um, uh, maintained that, uh, in, yes, indeed, eagles did carry away babies. He didn't dispute the myth either. Um, and so it was considered a necessarily expendable species because it was threat to the American economy. And one thing, let me, I'll mention this and I'll stop. Alaska imposed a bounty on the bald eagle that ran from 1917 to 1952. And because the, the uh, Alaskans believe that the bald eagle was, was a threat to the salmon industry and the fox fur industry. And the, uh, and the territory ended up paying bounties during that period, 1917 to 1952. Uh, for a hundred and over 128,000 bald eagle kills. Jeez, it's you know one of my favorite stories that you tell, and it's not you elaborated on it, but you tell so many stories in the book. Is this bald eagle shows up in New York City? I forget the year it is, but they yeah. hadn't seen eagles in New York in a while. They you yeah. write that you would occasionally see them floating on ice, kind of out you know in the waterways yeah. outside of the city. And of course, what's the reaction of the person that sees the bald eagle? He, he grabs his shotgun, he goes out there and he yep. shoots it. Yeah, yeah. Very, and, and, very, and then, and then there, and there's a, almost 1500 word article published in the New York Times about it. Uh, and who did described him in the title of that article as a sportsman. <laughs> and uh, that was 1888. And people, uh, the bald eagle had uh, nearly disappeared from the East Coast. And because it had been because of a habitat encroachment, but also because people were killing it. Yeah. And um, when Ben Franklin and the others were trying to uh, design a seal, uh, there were probably, according to some uh, uh, evidence, there, there were probably, there was probably a bald eagle nest uh, for every mile of the Delaware River up the river, and which is significant. And, uh, but that they weren't around. Um, by the um, late 19th century. Yeah, and you know, one thing you write, it's, I actually wrote down the quote, um, you write, quote, while the U.S. grew more secure, the bird of the wild grew less secure, end quote. And I, I always think about that when the guy's like, oh, well, there's an eagle in New York City. You never see that, so I'll blast it out of right. the sky. And, right. you know, as, as you kind of, you also write in the book a little bit, um, there's a great book called Death in the Everglades that talks about rookeries getting shot up, right? Yeah. Um, but the eagle's feathers aren't really valued much when it comes to women's um, fine wear and other clothing that these feathers are used for. So, you know, the eagle is really suffering a different fate, it seems, than some of these other birds that are being shot out of the sky, you know, rather mercilessly. Um, yes, it, it's, it's a bird of prey. And yeah. like a hawk uh, or a falcon uh, or an owl, it was to be dealt with. Um, and, and we also have to understand that a lot of people in the 19th century, whether they lived on farms or not, had chickens in their yards, you know, they, uh, for the eggs and for the broilers. And, um, and so they wanted to protect those chickens uh, from uh, any of those birds of prey that, that might, um, you know, fly away with their, their dinner. And, um, and so the, the bald eagle prefers fish to, ev uh, to everything else, but it will eat, um, um, it will eat uh, land mammals and it, it will eat other birds. Um, it's one of the few uh, bird species that actually uh, feeds from the, uh, the water, the sky and the land. Um, 
And so when there's no fish around or if there's easy pickings of, of, of a chicken, it's threatened. <laughs> yeah, a, and you, you tell a story about um, they ascend into, I forget the name of the eagle's nest, but they find chicken bones. You know, they don't find livestock yeah. bones. They don't find right, right, bones. Right, right. They find chicken bones. Um, but not, but not very many. It was, it was, it was mostly fish bones. Um, yeah. Uh, fish was the principal era. Yeah, this was in, uh, this was in the 1920s in, um, in um, outside of Cincinnati, o Ohio, on, on Lake Erie. And local farmers wanted to um, uh, remove, if you will, eradicate um, this nesting pair. Um, and eagles had nested in these particular woods um, since, uh, it, it, as far as anybody knows, uh, the early 19th century. And, um, and so an ornithologist climbed up in the nest uh, and did an investiga forensic investigation and discovered, uh, no, they weren't taking lambs, they weren't taking uh, anything. They were taking a few chickens, but not very many. It was primarily fish. Yeah, there's, there's no baby pacifiers up there or anything like that. Right, no, yeah, no baby <laughs> pacifiers. And, um, but they, um, and they, they, they succeeded in, in uh, saving that nest, uh, mm -hmm. preventing its uh, removal by, um, by the farmers. And that's something I want to talk about, definitely how things start to change in the 20th century. And I also want to talk about Native American understandings, because you write about this American Indian, un, Indian understandings of the eagle. But I think I would be remiss to leave the 1800s without you talking a little bit about Old Abe. And um, how Old Abe is this eagle that, you know, basically achieves Civil War fame and then is taxidermied because Abe, uh, I was talking to some of my friends about the book and they're like, oh, I've heard the story of Abe before. So before we transition to the last part of our, our chat today, what can you tell us about Abe and what does he tell us about the history of the bald eagle, his experiences? Yeah, well, Abe, um, as, as an eaglet, was taken um, um, by a um, Native person in Wisconsin who sold uh, the, the eaglet to a saloon keeper who then sold the eaglet to uh, a Wisconsin uh, regiment or a company of a regiment um, uh, about to uh, go off to war and convincing them that they needed a war eagle with them. Um, and Old Abe at this point is not named Old Abe and is a juvenile, but soon acquires that name and the company changed their name to, or they called themselves the Eagle Company. And Old Abe attended uh, the, um, the, um, the company throughout the war into all the battles, uh, 34 or more skirmishes, some of the major battles such as Vicksburg. Um, and Old Abe was uh, right out there in you know, in the, in the middle of gunfire and because he is raised up on a pedestal um, and next to the flag bearer and uh, he becomes a favorite target of the Confederates because they, they figure if they can shoot and kill old Abe, they would, uh, they would be uh, um, uh, hitting the heart of the, they uh, wanted to, uh, uh, you know, they were, they were targeting the heart of the, uh, of, of the uh, federal troops um, and the Confederates never succeeded in killing old Abe. And he said afterward, he became, uh, he remained in captivity, uh, property of the state of Wisconsin. And he uh, went on tour to raise money for military veterans and their families um, and uh, widows, um, and, but also orphans. And he did that for many years until he died in a fire in the Capitol building. And as I write in the book, Old Abe, um, you know, he transcended these two universes because he's a living eagle, but at the same time that he's a living eagle, he's a symbol. And I like to say that in dying in a fire in uh, the uh, Capitol building, and then he was mounted because it was, he was it died of smoke inhalation. But then I think it was 14 years later, the Capitol um, burned again and his mounted form was, uh, was incinerated. Um, and I like to say that it, um, that incident was uh, indicative of, of a status of this eagle transcending those two universes that was not supposed to be. Um, and, and that, um, and, and he's also a paradoxical, paradoxical image because he's the bird of freedom, right? But this is a bird that doesn't have its, its freedom. Um, and, but yes, he's, I've forgotten how many 13 or 14 biographies have been written on, <laughs> on old Abe's quite a popular guy. He is. And it was so sad. You know, you're talking about 
him being the, almost like the eagle, you know, in terms of the bird of paradox. And, you know, his handlers don't even treat him very well after his military service. I mean, he almost, he almost dies um, from starvation. So, you know, Abe is a really interesting story. So all the old Abe fans out there that have read about him before, I think they'll really like that part of the book. It was really interesting. Um, now, let me tell you real quick, a part that got cut out of the old Abe um, the old, the old Abe story is uh, about the dispute over whether old Abe was a male or female, because in the late 19th century, a, a, a female suffragist uh, maintained that old Abe was really a female masquerading as a male and claiming old Abe for the movement, uh, and which upset a lot of, of people in those days in a newspaper, Wisconsin newspaper said she, she should leave Wisconsin <laughs> until uh, if she values her own life. And, uh, and said that old Abe, everybody, everybody knows old Abe is not a she-male. Uh, old Abe is a he-male. And in 2014, in, in the, the controversy continued into the 21st century. And in two, 2014, uh, Wisconsin Historical Society uh, had some old feathers of old Abe and had a DNA uh, analysis done uh, and discovered that in fact, old Abe was a he-male. So it's official. So it's official. Yes. It's official. Okay. Um, well, we're, I'm just going to ask you a couple more questions and I just want to let the audience know if you have any questions, you're welcome to um, drop them. And uh, we're going to take a couple questions after we're done, but had just a couple more questions on my list for Jack. Um, you had mentioned this earlier and it's incredibly important. You know, the U S citizens have this really interesting relationship with the bird as symbol, right on the U S seal, you know, mm -hmm. um, as a menace, you know, it's going to steal your baby. Of course you should blast the thing out of the sky. And then that'll change in the 20th century, which we'll talk about. But then of course we have, um, North American Indians that are living here and their perception of the Eagle and their relationship with the Eagle is much different than, um, a lot of these U S citizens, especially of the shotgun toting variety that are firing into the sky. So can you tell us a little bit about, um, American Indian perspectives of the eagle and perceptions of the eagle? Yeah, of course, we don't want to lump all, all um, Indian cultures, native cultures into an undifferentiated whole. Uh, each, was, each was distinct. Uh, and uh, some uh, cultures had very close relationships with, with the bald eagle um, and are, are closer than other cultures. And, but generally the, the, the bald eagle was one of those birds that was regarded as a spirit bird and was regarded as a spirit bird by many um, uh, native um, cultures uh, all across the country. And uh, meaning that it was a messenger that uh, uh, spoke between uh, the people living on earth and, and the ancestors uh, in, the, in the spirit world, but also the great creator. And, but as a consequence, as a being a spirit bird, it was also a, its feathers were very much valued for rituals um, and, and ceremonies and uh, its talons um, uh, in, in some cases, the whole bird uh, or a beak or a head or a wing or a wing bone, uh, which was often used as, as a whistle uh, to communicate uh, with, with the higher spirits. And, uh, and so, um, so Indians did take eagles out of the environment uh, if, uh, to serve in their uh, ritualistic traditions, and um, the but there typically there was a designated eagle hunter who would go out and take the birds. Now some the the Zuni, for instance, would not actually kill the birds. They would they would capture them and then keep them in stockades, you know, giant bird cages and collect their feathers when they molted. And these birds could live a long life. They weren't free, but they could live a long life. Um, other, um, uh, such as the Hopi, would actually kill the birds, or in their case, um, uh, eaglets. Uh, and uh, in a very, you know, in a ceremony, in a very ritualistic way. But they would never take more than one bird, one eaglet out of a nest. And typically nests have two uh, in, in, in its brood. And, um, and so they never took so many eagles out of the environment that it jeopardized um, the stability of their, their population anywhere. Um, and they didn't, like Americans ultimately were doing, reverse the process of evolution. And, um, and it's a relationship with the, the bald eagle that 
continues today that has com complicated uh, the native relationship like so much does um, uh, comp comp um, complicated the native relationship with the federal government uh, mainly because of of the, the the protective the laws that protect um, the life of, of, of the bald eagle but that's a longer story that we don't have to get into now um, but it's but I think we have I argue in the book that I think the American people have come increasingly toward embracing the bald eagle similar to uh, the way um, native cultures have historically uh, in, embraced it. Yeah, and to, just a spoiler alert for um, everyone that's going to read the book, um, you have a deadliest catch reference in there and you talk about, you know, yeah. eagles up in the Dutch Harbor community and it's really interesting. So I'm not going to tell everybody about that, but yeah. it's worth a read. But the story you tell about Dutch Harbor and the deadliest catch is related to how perceptions of the eagle changes in the 20th century. You know, we showed the picture of the the person that, um, you know, blasted the eagle out of the sky with a yeah. pretty, you know, nasty grimace on his face. Um, but in the 20th century, all of a sudden, especially you, you tell the story in the 1920s about going up to the nest and saying, oh, well, there's some chicken bones in here, but it's mainly fish bones. And then things start to change and people become worried about the eagle and kind of like this, this wanton slaughter is going to come to an end, although it, it revs its ugly head a little bit later with pesticides. But I guess my, my question for you is, how does our understanding of the eagle and its relationship to U.S. history change um, in the 20th century? Yeah, it changes significantly um, in a large part because we had pushed it to the brink, right? And sometimes you don't, as we all know in our personal lives, uh, until you lose something, you don't always fully value it, right? And that's what was happening with, with the bald eagle. Um, and in 1940, the in Congress passed the Bald Eagle Protection Act, uh, which made it unlawful to harm uh, a, a bald eagle, take it out of the wild. And, um, and so this was unprecedented legislation. It was the first time that a predator animal had uh, federal protection. And it was the first time that a single species, animal, uh, any kind of animal, uh, bird or mammal species uh, had a single species had had its own federal law. Um, and so this is significant. Um, and it re represents these changing attitudes, um, again, um, that uh, really uh, derived from the fear of losing living representative uh, of, of the American symbol. Also, 1940 is what? America is about to go to war. Um, and uh, it would look um, terribly, uh, in, in, in some ways, not just paradoxical, but um, in, in, in some way inhumane um, for the US uh, to kill off its living symbol. And uh, when here it was fighting fascism and uh, fighting for freedom around the world, yet its bird of freedom has, has disappeared. And um, so, um, and people began to think differently about the bald eagle um, in, in terms of science, thanks to science, um, such as that, uh, the research on the, the bald eagles uh, on, on Lake Erie. Uh, and so people were learning more and more about um, this bird uh, and about birds of prey generally, and recognizing that they weren't such a threat. They were, in fact, an economic asset um, to American agriculture. Um, and um, but also in the background, there is the you know the, the conservation movement in the late nineteenth century that's raising awareness um, of loss and destruction. And then in the twentieth century, uh, after World War II, there's the emergence of the modern environmental movement um, that elevates awareness to an unprecedented level. Um, and so not only can we not lose the bald eagle, we can't lose a lot of the animals that we push to the brink. Yeah, and that, that becomes a, an important story that I know you tell at the end of the book. Um, and so what I'd like to do now, Jack, is we have a couple of questions that I wanted um, to read out to you. And um, okay. But before that, just sort of just to kind of wrap up our conversation, you know, when people pick up the book and, you know, they read through it and they're going to read these very descriptive and really beautiful passages about the eagle and its feathers and its flight patterns and its mating habits and things like that. And then they're gonna read about American history. 
Um, at the end of the day, you know, what do you want them to take away? What do you, what do you hope the reader, when they're finished with the book, you know, what's, what's in their thoughts? What's their mindset after they're done reading it? Well, I hope that they, they, one of the takeaways is that um, um, there, you know, nature is, the natural environment is part of our natural heritage, but, but also our national heritage. Uh, that uh, America's original identity was really based in um, our distinctive natural environment. Um, that's what set us apart from European nations. And that's, um, uh, in, in, that's that, that helped um, make us stand out as an, as an exceptional nation. Um, you're, you know, the European powers, um, France and England were, were quite envious of, of America, not just the so quote unquote natural resources that the United States possessed within its land, but um, also the natural beauty. Um, and it impressed everybody. And, and so I want readers to be aware that, um, you know, one of our founding values was this appreciation of the, the natural world. And the bald eagle, of course, uh, as the, the regal bird, the sovereign bird uh, presides over that and as a, a bird that's endemic to the, uh, North America, it presides over that, um, you know, that natural uh, environment and um, a, a, as just as much as it does our national identity and the two are connected. They're part of the same ecosystem, if you will. Yeah, yeah, this the myth and the reality, right? I mean, these things are all yeah. brought together. Yeah. But um, also, but one one other thing, one other important point is that yeah. I want them to know that the bald eagle has shown us that we can live with wild creatures in peace, and we can appreciate them. And when we appreciate them, we are actually appreciating something about ourselves because we have created an environment that it can survive in. And when we create an environment that a species like the bald eagle can survive in, we're creating a better quality of life for ourselves um, because that environment, that nest is our nest too. And when we foul the, the eagle's nest, we foul our own. Um, and we've come back from, from those days, from those decades when we had fail, fouled uh, um, our, our combined nests. Yeah. Yeah. So it sounds like your outlook is positive. I mean, we've sort of come through hopefully the doldrums and then the future for the Eagle and then the nation mm -hmm. will be looking up. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So let me see if I can access these questions real quick. Um, so here's a Florida question, Jack. Uh, sure. Is Florida home to a lot of Eagles? If so, where do these things live? Florida's Eagle story is a fantastic one. Um, and I wasn't uh, fully aware of it until I started uh, researching and writing this book. And I have such a great appreciation for Florida eagles, um, bald eagles. Yes, it has one of the largest um, eagle populations, um, nesting populations, just say. That's generally how we measure the population by nesting populations. Uh, and it has one of the largest um, nesting populations among the 48 U.S. states, probably around 1,500 nesting bald eagles. Now, with those nests, you also have their juveniles, not just from the year that their eggs hatch, but from previous years, because juveniles tend to come back to their, uh, their natal territory. And uh, so we have a really sizable uh, and healthy bald eagle population in Florida. And because in, it, in um, and right there in Tampa, as a matter of fact, in the 1930s, a Canadian banker retired to Tampa at age 59, turning 60. He decides he wants to start banning bald eagles. Nobody was doing it. Uh, and there were lots of bald eagle nests in those days around Tampa Bay. Uh, Charles Broly was his name. And, uh, and he's really advancing science, science. He's not a scientist. And uh, over the course of 20 years, he banded um, some 1,200 bald or eaglets around the Tampa Bay area, um, climbing, uh, you know, 70, 80 foot long leaf pines up until age 79. Jeez. And those Florida birds taught us about bald eagle migration. A juvenile in Tampa will fly as far as Canada um, and uh, between nesting seasons. Uh, one of the longest migrations of bald eagles. Some bald eagles don't migrate 
um, very far, some, uh, uh, particularly the adults, but the juveniles um, you know, have this excess energy and they wanna go. Um, but also what Florida did, and this is a fantastic story because it's, its population remained fairly healthy even after the DT, throughout DET. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was hit, uh, it was hit hard, but it had been so robust before DDT um, that it remained um, a, a fairly healthy population. And in the 1970s and 1980s, when the federal, uh, when Fish and Wildlife, U.S. Fish and Wildlife initiated restoration programs uh, around, um, uh, around the country and uh, every region of the country, the other southern states were in dire shape. Some of them didn't have any nesting bald eagles, uh, such as Mississippi and Alabama. Um, and uh, and what so because ball because Florida had a fairly healthy uh, bald eagle population. What they would do, what scientists and researchers would do, is they come to Florida. They would take one egg out of a nest with at least two uh, eggs in it and uh, take it up to Oklahoma um, to a eagle center up there, a raptor center, incubate the eggs, hatch them, uh, and then raise the, the eaglets in states such as Alabama, Mississippi, Arkansas, Oklahoma, uh, Georgia, South Carolina, uh, and raise them uh, in those states in boxes or giant cages before they were released. So when they were ready to mate, they would come back to those states. Uh, over the course, I think it was five years, nearly 300 eggs, bald eagles in Florida donated uh, um, uh, some nearly 300 eggs to this cause and repopulated those other southern states. Now, what they would do different from the Zuni is they would take both of the eggs, all the eggs in a nest early on after they were hatched, and the, and the parents or the female would double clutch. She would come in and lay a new set of eggs. Um, and, um, and, uh, and so they didn't lose any population um, as, as a result of forsaking those eggs or as I like to say, donating those eggs. <laughs> so a great heroic story for the Florida bald eagle. Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah, and you know, the, the book is really filled with these, these interesting facts. I, you were talking about how they migrate and you tell the story, I think it's two birds that end up in Ireland. And, you know, the bald eagle is really a North American bird that sometimes goes down into Central America. But, it, you know, it does have this really wide migration pattern and, you know, these amazing abilities. It's one of the realities of the birds, right, that you talk about. Um, yeah, and, the, and there's, there's, really, there's really nothing um, that is uniform in the pattern of their, their, uh, their migrations. Um, bald eagles just want food. So Northern bald eagles sometimes don't even migrate. Uh, even when a pond, you know, the water ice is over, as long as they can get access to food, they can handle the cold um, and they'll stay put. And they're excellent ice fishers, by the way. Um, and I have this wonderful picture uh, photograph for my book, which a bald eagles with one talon is pulling a salmon out of a hole in the ice as if the bald eagle had cut the hole in the ice, which it had not. Um, and, uh, and, uh, you know, Canadian bald eagles will fly down to North America um, after nesting season. Well, American bald eagles will fly up to Canada uh, after nesting season and they switch places uh, more or less. Um, and so scientists can't completely explain what's, what's going on here. Um, but there's, there's seen from the human perspective, there seems like there's, there, there's no uh, logic to uh, the migration um, patterns of quote unquote the uh, patterns of, of bald eagles. Yeah, well, the eagle probably thinks the same thing about human migration. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's, yeah, that's right. Especially uh, all, when they see all the traffic on I four and I seventy five uh, at the malfunction junction, they're wondering, "What the hell is that?" <laughs> yeah, absolutely. All right, so here's one question, and you kind of got at this earlier, but I think this is a really good question for us to kind of wrap everything up. Um, and before I ask it, just wanted to reiterate how much we appreciate your time today mm -hmm. um, and being with us. But um, the question is really simple. You know, what motivated you to write this book at the end of the day? Uh, well, as I, as I said earlier, I, I wanted to write an environmental book that would have a broad appeal and um, to, to people of all, of all political backgrounds. And uh, the, the bald eagle seemed like the, 
um, the, the, the logical subject for such a book. All right. Well, I just want to thank, obviously, uh, Dr. Davis, the Rothman Family Chair in Humanities at the University of Florida, and our audience, and of course, the people at the Duckwall and the Saunders Foundations for joining us today. Um, we have the Florida Conversations events coming up. I forgot my list, so I can't, I just blew it. I can't do the blurb. Um, but uh, this is part of our Museum from Home program as well, too, where we try to offer content at home. It's been part of our, our um, initiative in these last um, trying um, months. So we appreciate you all being with us today, and we appreciate Pulitzer Prize winning author uh, Jack Davis being um, with us today. And we hope that you tune in next time um, when the Tampa History Center um, does the Duckwall Lecture and our other programs here. So with that, thank you all very much.